Mary, did you know that your baby boy would someday walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm? His hand. Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you've kissed your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. The blind will see. the dead will live again, the lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy was heaven's perfect land? The sleep child you're holding is the great I Thank you, Brian and Becky. What an awesome reminder, awesome song, way to start our Christmas uh, Sunday service. Good to see you all. Welcome, and it's uh, good to be here with you. Is it too early to say Merry Christmas? No? Okay. Merry Christmas. Uh, so, so we can say that all week, even if we see each other like 15 times. We can say Merry Christmas every time we see each other, and that's good. Uh, take the time to, to fill out your welcome cards. They're in front of you on, in your chair racks. Uh, th there's also a QR code, ah, there it is, up there that you can scan with your phone. We have become high tech, okay? We're not very good at it, but we are high tech. And so you with your, your smartphones can actually scan that and do your connection card, your online connection card, and connect with us. I'd appreciate if you do that. We, we want to hear from you. We want to connect. We want to get your prayer request. Uh, updated information. We want all that information just so that we can uh, draw closer together. And so I'd encourage you to do that at some point later in the service. There may be an opportunity uh, to respond on the connection card for um, the coming days and coming year. It's almost 2021. Who, who says, I cannot believe it's almost 2021, right? Weren't we supposed to be riding in hovercrafts and stuff and working for Mr. Spacely by then? And none of us are, I don't believe. Uh, giving boxes are in the back of the sanctuary. We, we don't pass a plate, but we do believe in giving. I'd encourage you to give. Uh, this is, we're coming to year end. I understand tax deductions have changed radically over the, the course of the last few years, and, and perhaps people don't itemize as much as they would, as they would in the past. But if, if you need to get giving in by the end of the year, this would be a good Sunday to do it. Next Sunday, there'll be no services here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to close with our Christmas Eve service. And then I'm going to give staff and leadership team, I don't know if you know this, but the way we're doing things now with people in the back and, 
and, and, and videoing and soundboard and all the team. They're going to be pre preparing very hard for Christmas Eve and then the turn around and prepare for another service the, 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 the following two days later and, and, uh, and all the technical people that are involved in that and just with everything going on, we're sick of 2020. And all God's people said, and so this will be the last Sunday morning service of the year. That doesn't seem right, but then we'll pick back up in the first Sunday in, in 2021. And so uh, it, you might want to give today if you were planning on giving uh, a big chunk. If you're giving a big chunk next week, give it today, please, okay? Uh, but, but the giving boxes are back there. Boy, I digress. Uh, <laughs> and so keep that in mind. Christmas Eve service. You should be getting an email uh, pretty quickly, and you can also respond on the QR card. You could have done it like that. You could do it on the website. Uh, please let us know which service you're going to be in. We want to plan. We want to make sure that we have adequate spacing. We want to make sure that you're protected, that we're doing all that we need to do. Uh, December 24th at 6 and 7.30. The 6 o'clock live stream will be, uh, will be live streamed, the 6 o'clock service, and then we will have one at 7.30 as well. And so we encourage you to, to do one of them, to come to, to one of those uh, Christmas Eve services. If you can't do either of them or watch on Christmas Eve, that is what we will be rebroadcasting on December 27th. We will be rebroadcasting the Christmas Eve service so that perhaps you have family in and you can gather together once more and, and celebrate Christmas uh, together. Well, I think that's all I have. And so um, I'm going to light some candles, and, and Amy's going to read. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a place of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. The, that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been cut or I have been with you wherever you have gone and I have cut off all of your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men of the earth and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and can no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Jumping to verse 16. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me and your throne will be established forever. I am so thankful that we get to call our God Emmanuel, God with us. That is something to be praised this morning. Amen. Would you guys stand with me as we sing?
visitation that your son Jesus Christ at his coming may find us in a mansion prepared for himself who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit one God now and forever amen well good morning I hope to see many of you on Christmas Eve, so I'm going to say Merry Christmas today, but also I hope that I get that chance to wish you again on Christmas Eve. I just love Christmas. When I look around, when I get to watch my kids experiencing it, I feel like every year something new comes out that they have latched onto or just found to be so amazing and so wonderful. We've got the lights, we've got the music, we've got so many of our family traditions, and in it all, the center of it all is this story, the story of God loving an entire world of beautifully broken people so much that he sent his son to be born here. And um, there's so much in that story to marvel at and to be amazed at and to truly, based on what we usually understand as our reality, to see as impossible. But That is not usually how our kids experience this story. They don't usually come up with all the ways that this story couldn't happen the way that the Bible says it did. They just marvel and wonder at this baby born in a stable, the shepherds coming, the wise men coming. And I got to think about why our kids find it so easy to accept and marvel and just experience this story in a way that it's really hard for us adults to sometimes. And that is because our kids are hardwired to be amazed by things. Um, A series of books that often makes its way into our house are these Guinness World Record books. So if you have kids in your house, or maybe it's just you, these books are fascinating. My kids will bring them and just pour over them. And they will come and show me all of these pictures of these amazing feats and records that these people hold. Um, In here, this guy has this giant tricycle. It says it's the world's largest, heaviest rideable tricycle that weighs 1,650 pounds. So he's actually able to pedal this thing. 
And as I was looking through this, and it's like man-made marvels, get ready to ooh and ah, there is still a limit to what we can create, what we can make. We are bound by some laws, and I am no longer a science teacher, so I don't remember all of them, but they involve things like gravity and friction and centrifugal force and all of these things that limit our ability to create and to do things. At some point, there are some bounds. And so when I look at how amazing these things are, I am just floored to realize that we serve a God who not only designed all these laws, these things that hold our world together in order, but is also not bound by them. And so when we hear stories of impossible things happening, like an old woman becoming pregnant and having a baby, a young girl, an angel coming and telling her that she's going to have a baby, and she says, wait, that's impossible. Those reactions are because we understand and we appreciate the order that God has designed in our world, but we also know that he's not bound by those laws, bound by that order. So this year, I invite you to take a step back and to think about what it would be like as a child to hear this Christmas story for the first time again, to not know some of the things we know that would limit the amazing, wonderful aspect of this story, and to just hear it and experience it for what it is, which is an impossible, beautiful, miraculous story. Um, Josh and I, when we talk with our kids and our teens, we um, talk about different dials in their lives. There's a, there's a wonder dial, a, a way that you can really dial in and help them to e explore and experience how amazing God is. Then there's also this discovery aspect where they're digging deeper and learning more about him, which then flows into them living out an authentic faith and that becoming part of their passion, part of their heartbeat. And some of that goes along with their development. But at each stage, we don't lose the other ones. Sometimes we just don't tap into them. So as adults, we often talk about our passions and the things that drive us, but we forget to be amazed. We forget to have that wonder of hearing things for the first time. So this Christmas, I just invite you to maybe put aside the commentaries, put aside all the ways that sometimes people have tried to explain away some of the miracles and try to have that faith of a child where you hear it and you just get to experience this beautiful gift that God sent us. Thank you, Pastor Mara, for that great reminder. Well, here's my um, favorite Christmas movie of all time. Who's a jingle all the way uh, person? You know, th this is a perfect Christmas movie for a household of boys, okay? We had three boys. There's, there's no fairy princesses, there's no singing, there's no reindeers, there's no dancing, there's no mermaids, just Arnold and action. And for older guys like me, this movie also has James West in it. Who knows who James West is? Okay, oh, three of you. Oh, you poor pitiful people. Robert Conrad is in this movie. This is a movie we watched many, many, many times over the Christmas season with the boys, and they would watch it over and over. As a matter of fact, Spencer and I watched it this week. And, and all of us have been in Arnold's Place. If you're not familiar with the, the movie, that the, the toy in the kid's hand is a Turbo Man, and his dad had promised his son he was going to get him Turbo Man, and he didn't get it. And it was the day before Christmas, and he's trying to find a Turbo Man. All of us have been in that position at one time or another. Most of us have been, who's never been in that position where you're desperately searching so we can just give you a dirty look, okay? Anybody? You know, all of us have that, done with that where we're desperately searching for a gift, and, and maybe this may be one of those years. You know, we, we've become so reliant on online shopping and the delivery of online shopping gifts, and uh, some of you are still waiting for your online shopping gifts to come, Right? And uh, some of you will be either simply wrapping a receipt, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you're a receipt wrapper, or you'll be desperately searching for a replacement gift. And so as we think about Christmas and we think about seeking and then trying to get the perfect gift, I think it fits perfect on this Christmas Sunday to, to talk about looking for the perfect gift and, and our seeking God. We, we've been talking about disruptive innovations. 
And a disruptive innovation is an innovation that impacts the lives of ordinary people. In other words, it changes the lives of ordinary people. So Henry Ford, when he did the assembly line, now everyone could have a car. And this was a disruptive innovation. Every person could have a car, or most people could have a car. And Christmas is a disruptive innovation. Jesus, the birth of Jesus, changed everything. And over the last two weeks, we've looked at a couple different things. First, we experienced the kingdom by turning and trusting, not through perfect religious performance. And then last week, we saw that God wants our broken. Every other religion, God just wants the best, but, but God wants our broken, our less than best as well. And we're going to look at one more thing this week. Um, I, and, I, and I thought of this as I was um, preparing for um, uh, Nancy's son, Charlie, funeral. We were talking about how Charlie was really seeking God at the end, and, and we were celebrating that, but it really hit me, this disruptive innovation of a seeking God. God seeks us more than we seek him. You know, it, it, it's the story of God paying more of a price than we pay. It, it, it says God who writes our names on his hands. See, so, so we serve this seeking God. And the story that we'll read today will illustrate. This is in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you for the reason this, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. That's a phrase that's worth repeating. Say that with me. For nothing will be impossible with God. Nike did not invent that phrase, okay? That's a God phrase. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, now there's a lot of things in this story that I, that I think we need to see to, to understand the significance of what's going on here. The first thing is, where was Nazareth? Uh, Philip says, when he sees Jesus, he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, in other words, one of Jesus' disciples says, man, that's nowhere. Uh, that, that's in the middle of nowhere. It's, it, it, it's, it's not a great place to be from. And as a matter of fact, that the people of Israel would have been looking to Bethlehem, where Jesus is born, not Nazareth. In Jesus' day, the, the name Nazarene, was associated with the despised. And so for Jesus to be a Nazarene, to be from Nazareth, is to associate with the despised. As a matter of fact, we are Marysville Church of the Nazarene. Uh, and uh, sometimes we call ourselves Marysville Church of the Naz, okay? But the Naz is long, short for Nazarene. And Nazarene has this roots. We, we took this name as a denomination because we purposefully wanted to be associated with the forgotten, the despised, those outside the typical religious establishment. I don't, I don't think we emphasize that enough in our church, that, that that's the beauty of that name, that, that when our founders began the Nazarene church, they were saying, listen, we want to be a church that exists for those outside religious organization. Well, we want to be a church for the people that are forgotten, and broken. I think about Nazareth, and you know, Nazareth, Gabriel goes to Nazareth, and it's not part of the Old Testament record. It's unknown, it's not esteemed. It's this city in the middle of nowhere. Now, I grew up in Connorsville, Indiana, 
and really, Connersville was in the middle of nowhere, but we didn't know that, okay? We, we thought that Laurel, Indiana was the middle of nowhere. And, and Laurel was a city in the same town that was a little bit rougher than Connersville. And, and Laurel, think cars on blocks in the front yard, right? And, and Laurel, think Long Branch Saloon. And, and it, that's what it was called, Long Branch Saloon. And the stories of this little place was legendary. You know, back in the 60s and 70s when people were wearing long hair, people getting their hair cut with pocket knives while being held down. Okay, that kind of place. And the people doing that weren't the rough crowd. They were connected to the local authorities. <laughs> so, so think Nazareth in that way. Think, think outside of a, a very urbane place, but this very outsider kind of place. And and, and, and this is where the angel goes, in Mary. Yeah, she's a descendant of David, but really nothing else. There, there's no status in her society. She, she's a woman, and she's engaged. So she's committed to Joseph, but Joseph could have very easily ended the engagement, and then she would have been no one, forgotten, no support, rejected. So we have this ordinary place. In fact, we have a less than ordinary place. We, we have an ordinary person. Really, we have a less than ordinary person. And then we have the beginning of the passage. Now, in the sixth month, the, gave, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Nowhere. To a virgin engaged to a man who, who's, whose name was Joseph of descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, less than ordinary. It's all God initiative. God sends Gabriel to the middle of nowhere to someone that's completely unknown. I think about the other birth stories. I think of Hannah and Eli. Hannah's the, the mother of Samuel, and, 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 and Eli, Haniel, Hannah is at the temple, and, and she's at the tabernacle, and she's seeking, and she's praying, and she's asking God, but she's seeking, and God blesses her with Samuel. I think about Abraham and Sarah, and Sarah looking for the birth of a son, and, and they are following, pursuing God, that before Sarah has a child, she has pursued God and left her homeland, and yet here God comes to Mary. God seeks ordinary people in ordinary places. That this is the image of our God, and this is something that we learn, particularly in this story, that God seeks ordinary people in ordinary places. But there's purpose. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Here's the disruptive innovation. God seeks ordinary people in ordinary places to join God's extraordinary mission. That, that wherever you are, wh whoever you are, God is inviting you, seeking you, and, and challenging you to play a part in the ushering in of the kingdom. See, Mary's going to play this significant role in the kingdom's growth, in the growth and ushering in the kingdom. This is good news for us, right? We're ordinary. Uh, Marysville is where the grass is greener, right? Uh, but it's not the center of the universe. Maybe it is to you. Yet God invites us to something extraordinary, to, to join his kingdom mission. And, and how does Mary join? And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord May it be done to me according to your word. Simple obedience. Mary just says, yes. Can we put this all together? 
God seeks ordinary people in ordinary places to join God's extraordinary mission through simple obedience. Just saying yes. Extraordinary is on the other side of our yes to God. And so we serve this God that is seeking. And the question becomes, are you available? Are you available? Are you willing to say yes? God's plan is bigger than we can imagine. Are you willing? Simple obedience is the doorway to extraordinary. So are you choosing God's extraordinary or simply going through the motions of ordinary? Now, I've heard this sports phrase over the past uh, few years. It seems like it's become the, the new phrase they use all the time, that uh, availability is the best ability. In other words, if someone's available to play, if they're not injured, uh, if somebody has more ability than them and they're hurt and they're sitting on the bench, guess what? The person that's available will make more impact on a game than the person with the greater ability that's not available. Your availability is more important than your ability. You know, as I was standing, we had people in the back. Usually in this service, I'll, I'll sit on the back, uh, back row, but... We had a lot of people in the back row, so, you know, I was kind of just to keep some, give them space and, and not just jump on top. And I thought, well, I'll just watch over here and, and listen to the service over here. And as I was listening to the service over here, um, an extraordinary thing happened. I heard the kids singing. You don't hear them back here, but I heard them up here. Um, I want you to know, whatever your age, whoever you are, God is seeking you. Kids on the front row, God is desperately seeking you. And your availability is more important than your abilities. Your, your willingness to say yes to God is your best ability. Now, can I give you a caution here? <laughs> you know, I, I use that phraseology, and I think people live in these ordinary lives, and they think oh, he's lying. You know, I still had to go to work Monday morning, right? You know, I'm still having to pay a mortgage. You know, everything seems very ordinary. Most of Mary's life stayed ordinary. You know, Jesus doesn't begin his earthly ministry until he's around 30 years old. So, so that means that, that Mary, if she's 13, 14 years old, however she is, she, she's 44 years old before she really begins to see what God is doing in Jesus. So most of her life is ordinary. Everything didn't change other than having a baby. Uh, you know, there, there's some awesome events. You know, shepherds waking you up in the middle of the night. You know, dirty, rotten shepherds. That was pretty cool. You know, the wise men dropped off some gifts. They lived in Egypt for a while. But then they moved back to Nazareth. And Joseph opened his carpentry shop. And he worked. She raised kids, and most of her life was just pretty ordinary. But the impact of her yes had far-reaching implications. We may not see the full extraordinary impl implications of our yes, but, but I, can, I can assure you based on the authority of God's word, the way that God works, when we say yes, when we're available, our simple obedience makes a huge impact, not only in our world, but in the world's to come. Your yes is not confined to this moment in time. Can we put the uh, card thing back up there? How can we help you? You know, we, we, we exist as a staff. I exist as a pastor not to do the work of the ministry, but to equip you and engage you in the work of the ministry. If I'm simply doing the work of the ministry, then we're missing the whole point of what this community is all about. The pastor exists to equip you, to move you along, to help you find your yes. 
And so I'd encourage you, take your card out, take, take your phone out. Is there some way that I can help you? Is there some way that Pastor Mara or Amy or Pastor Josh can help you in finding your place? We are here for you. It's Christmas time. And then about a week later, most years, it's New Year's Day, right? And, and we're all anticipating 2021. We're hoping pastors' jokes are funnier, right? We're, we're, we're hoping that we'll see people's full faces. That'll be nice, right? Uh, we're, we're hoping for all of these t- things to happen. But, but there's a freshness and there's a possibility about Christmas. I think Mara's right. I think kids get that more than adults. I think we get so caught up in the season and the hustle and the bustle that sometimes we miss the freshness of this time. This is a time. Christmas is a time. New Year's is a time to say yes once again to God. Maybe it's, maybe it's just a reaffirmation. Maybe you just need to say, God, I'm still here for you. Or maybe it's a turning. Maybe it's a fresh new page, a fresh new entry in your journey of life. There's a freshness and a possibility of 2021. Because I say that, I'm sure I said something like that in 2019, about 2020. And I guess what I would say is this. I'm not promising all rainbows and butterflies, but I am promising that when we say yes to God, when we're available for God to use, he will use us in ways beyond our imagination. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, right now we just give you praise and thanks for the story that we've read today, what it means, the the significance of Mary and her yes to you, the, the significance of her being available you. And Lord, as I think about the impact of Mary and her special, special role in your plan and the growth of your kingdom, Lord, I can only begin to imagine what that might look like if everyone in this room were to say yes to the same extent as Mary. If we simply live lives that said, Whatever you want, Lord, I am a bond slave to you, and I will live as you've asked me to live. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I'll go wherever you ask me to go. I'll give whatever you ask me to give. I'll serve however you ask me to serve. Lord, what, what would our community look like? What would our church look like? What would our neighborhoods look like? Lord, I believe you still seek and you still speak. I pray now, Lord, that um, we will respond, we will worship by saying yes to your seeking and your speaking. Now, Lord, as we come up on this Christmas day, this Christmas event, this Christmas celebration, Lord, we're going to be gathering with friends and family. And I pray that in these gatherings, you will be present, that... um, It won't simply be about the gifts that we give or the gifts that we get. It won't be about simply the decorations. These things are all nice. We all enjoy them. But Lord, may this truly be a season where we see you uh, first and foremost. Be, Be with these people. Bless them. Keep them and protect them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. 